uh, I told him, boy, that's great. I won't have to uh, contribute to the square books economy. So it all worked out. Um, we need oh, you yeah. both. Thank yeah. you both for, for doing what you do. It makes my job a lot easier. Um, <laughs> so let, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Caitlin. I'm the events coordinator here at Square Books in Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, we're here this evening to talk about a bad dog that did uh, wonderful things. Uh, but before we kind of dive into that and I pass it over to Rick and Curtis, I'd like to tell you about some upcoming events. I'll try to be brief, but we've got a lot of cool stuff that I think you'll be interested in. So tomorrow, that's um, Thursday, we actually have two events uh, for locals. We've got Thacker Mountain Radio uh, at the open air Old Armory Pavilion. Lots of room to spread out, social distance. Please bring your own chair. We won't have them, but we will have the books. Uh, the book this week is King of the Blues, The Rise and Reign of B.B. King by Daniel DeVise. Um, and there will be a Memphis rocker, John Paul Keith, and the Saratones front woman, AJ Haynes for music. And of course, our house band, the Yellow Bushwhackers. Uh, if you don't live in Oxford, you can visit our website for links on how to listen remotely. Then at seven o'clock tomorrow night, we are co-hosting a virtual event featuring Jonathan Franzen in conversation with novelist Jamie Attenberg to celebrate Franzen's newest novel and the first in a trilogy, uh, it's called Crossroads. This event is a little bit different because you do have to purchase a copy of the book in order to get access for the event, uh, to the event. Uh, but the good news is it's not too late to do so, and we have signed stock, and you can figure out all the nitty-gritty by visiting squarebooks.com. Um, then next week, Tuesday, um, to October 19th, um, the new Grisham uh, thriller, The Judge's Sale, goes, or The Judge's Sale, The Judge's List goes on sale. We'll have plenty of signed first editions. Come see us for that. Then that evening at 6 p.m. Central Time, that's Tuesday, 10, 19, we're hosting Susan Orlean, and she's the author of Juggernauts, the library book, and The Orchid Thief. She'll be on Zoom to celebrate her latest essay collection on animals. And uh, Nathaniel Rich, uh, novelist, environmental journalist, and good pal of the bookstore, uh, will be uh, her conversation partner free to attend, but registration is required. Last one, uh, Wednesday, October 20th at 6 p.m., we're welcoming back University of Mississippi MFA alum, Julian Randall. Um, he's going to be in conversation with Arielle Marie to discuss her dazzling debut collection of poetry, Gumbo Yaya. They are both uh, Kawe Kanem uh, winners. Uh, so if you're into poetry, I would not miss this one. Again, free to attend, uh, but you do need to register on our website. Enough about them. Um, I would like to tell you about the two gentlemen on your Zoom screen this evening. Um, first, uh, Rick Bragg, Man of the Hour. Rick is the author of 10 books, including best-selling, um, I guess in general, but also at Square Books specifically, uh, Ava's Man and All Over But the Shoutin'. He's a regular contributor to Southern Living and Garden and Gun, and he lives in Alabama, but we won't hold that against him. Um, <laughs> and then our, our host this evening is Curtis Wilkie. Um, Curtis Wilkie has covered civil rights activity in Mississippi in the 1960s and afterward served as a national and international course Correspondent for a quarter century at the Boston Globe. He lives in Oxford, Mississippi, and we are so glad that he does. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and um, move on to the main event, but we will have a Q&A portion uh, towards the end. So if you do have any questions for Rick or Curtis, please submit them in the Q&A and I will come back later and we'll kind of moderate those. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for doing this. I know our readers are in for a treat. Um, Y'all have fun. Okay. Caitlin, thank you. Thank you. Rick, Rick it's uh, good to see you again. It's been several <laughs> years uh, since we've seen you in Oxford. If you, just before we get into talking about your book, bring us up to date on where you've been the last, uh, since, since we last saw you. Well, uh, last, uh, last week, I loaded my pickup down with 600 pounds of hog finisher and cracked corn and shelled corn and dog food and livestock sweet feed and uh and then you know went 
and unloaded it. So really, Curtis, I'm kind of doing exactly the same damn thing I did 40 years ago. You're not moonshining, are you? you no, know, sir. I, if I had the talent, I am without talent in that area, but I know where I'd bring it to have it tested. Uh, but, uh, but mom, mom, uh, got, uh, sick, uh, several years ago and, uh, you know, coming home was the logical and the right thing for me to do. And, you know, I hadn't been home very long. I kind of got sick myself, wound up with uh, non-Hodgkin's. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, there's a line in the new book where I say, I kind of knew I'd never get out of this red dirt alive anyway. So it's good to be home. And it's good to be home at this point in my life. It's good to be home trying to take care of my people. Uh, we lost my brother, Sam. Uh, uh, to pancreatic cancer just, uh, in the spring. And, um, you know, it's, 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 there's just something I don't have to tell you, you know, that you get in this point in your life and living just seems to mean a whole lot more to you. Uh, not always happy, sometimes pretty melancholy, but, um, but, um, uh, I think I'm probably home for good. Yeah. Well, we're thankful you're still with us, and we're glad you're still cranking out to these good books. Uh, <laughs> tell us a, a bit about the main character in this latest one, Spec, uh, the Speckled Beauty. Yeah. Well, I was uh, I was in the back yard. Uh, and saw this uh, kind of gray lump up on the ridge line. Um, when I got lucky with a book some years ago, we got mom a 40-acre farm in Calhoun County, Alabama. And um, it's uh, a red cedar cabin uh, that is built into a mountainside and uh, – up on the ridge behind that cabin, I saw this, this dog and um, just laying there on the ridge line, looking at the backyard. And uh, uh, next day it was still there. And the third day and uh, my conscience took over. I thought it would just move on, you know, like strays do, but it, this one didn't move on. And I went up there and, and he'd about starved to death. He was uh, an Australian shepherd with one good eye. He'd been in a dog fight and they had tore him up pretty good. Uh, hurt one eye, the left eye, still has the eye, but it was jet black. Uh, and he was... I picked him up and it was kind of like I said, it was kind of like toting feathers in a pillow case. You know, he was so light and uh, took him home and we patched him up and fed him about 50 pounds of white milk gravy and scrambled eggs. And, and, uh, and then he proceeded to tear up everything on 40 acres he terrorized the livestock and would start a stampede. But because he only had one good eye, he'd run them in a circle. Uh, he terrorized the cats. He dragged carrion, usually deer, you know, where a deer hunter would field dress their deer. He dragged the, the carrion up in the yard and lay there gnawing on it. I mean, imagine how pleasant that was. And, uh, and he peed on everything that he could find. But the thing that made, and he fought the other dogs, uh, you know, he was a fighter. He was a stray. And uh, my brother Sam was still with us then, and he 
he told me a hundred times, he said, man, you ought to know better. You just ought to know better. And, uh, and he's just, he, he's just a damn terrible dog. A terrible in every single way. And, uh, but I discovered over time, over the years, as people got, you know, as people, uh, got older here and some of them passed and, you know, and a, a good dog, you know, a good, nice old flopping around dog is a great thing to have when things are going good. But on one of them kind of desolate days, one of those days where I think Larry McMurtry described it as when you live beside a river of melancholy, then a good dog's not much count. You need a bad dog. And this is a bad, bad dog. Oh, he's a he's a good bad dog. I think. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, you've written lovingly about uh, members of your family, and uh, you know, including your brother Sam, to whom the book is dedicated. Um, yeah. And he was not uh, wild about uh, spec, as as you say. But it seemed like the dog really became a real honest God member of your family. It was startling how, uh, you know, Curtis, I never believed in those magical stories about dogs. You know, I grew up with my brother's hunting dogs, you know, coon dogs that were more machine, you know, than they were flesh and blood. And I just didn't believe in magic dogs. And, but this dog, uh, and again, this is a dog that would tear up an heirloom quilt, you know, that would just tear it to pieces in the blink of an eye, you know, who, who, uh, just rotten. But, he had the smarts to know when somebody was down and people have always told me that's just a dog being a dog. Dogs just know when people are down, but I didn't really believe in any of that. And, um, but when my mama lost the last of her great family, the people that I've written about for 25, 30 years, the dog knew she was down. And when my brother Sam got tragically ill, um, the dog, even though my brother had never said a kind word to him, would go and sit with him and they would sit, my brother would sit in a lawn chair and him and the dog would watch the sunset. This was night after night after night. And, uh, and of course, he stuck by me, you know, through some pretty uh, desolate times. And I still don't know if I believe in magic dogs, but I believe in bad dogs now. <laughs> uh, yeah, your home in, in North Alabama, uh, any good uh, farmhouse has quite a menagerie around the cats and cattle and probably chickens and certainly mules who speak terrorize. Um, there is a great irreverent passage in, in your book that I want to uh, read particularly for an Oxford audience. Yeah, I saw you this talk, coming. You talk about mules and, you know, of course, uh, a lot of people here thought Faulkner had the franchise on wisdom about mules, but here's what you say. The mule endures in a strange kind of fascination for Southern intellectuals and has been studied by them. They have determined there can be no genuine Southern literature unless it has at least one mule in it, preferably a dead one. Faulkner said a mule would wait patiently a lifetime for an opportunity to kick you once, which tells me 
Faulkner did not know shit about mules. Mules will kick you hard and often, and when it is convenient, if they only kick once, it was because they killed you the first time. Yeah, I know the, the Faulkner files are going to be after me with pitchforks and torches, but uh, uh, I can guarantee tell you that our mule does not have the patience to kick anybody once or wait very long uh, to do it. And we even have little jackasses. We have them little Sicilian donkeys, you know, and they have kicked me routinely for about 14 years. So uh, trying to keep that dog from getting his brain scrambled, you know, I would, and my fear of, of mules, uh, the, the big mule, of course, can take you out of this world. But them little, tiny, irritating jackasses, uh, they will just step on your feet. So uh, I spent half my life, it seemed like, the past five years dancing around that pasture trying to keep them jackasses from stomping my bad dog to death. Uh, and I, so I was in a bad mood when I wrote that line about Faulkner. Uh, I, I want to bring up another uh, comment by another writer we both knew. It was oh, about 40 years ago in a conversation I had with uh, uh, the writer David Halberstam. He lamented to me that uh, somebody's got to stop really from writing about these damn dogs. Uh, yeah. David, of course, was a New Yorker, but he had affinity for Mississippi, but uh, I, I doubt he ever had a, a dog in Manhattan. But uh, David felt Willie was squandering his talents. And uh, uh, I, just, uh, I just note that there's been so many good books you know, and written about dogs and Primarily, it seems like uh, Southerners are the ones who have a greater appreciation for, it. you know, Gardening Gun now uh, has a regular uh, essay uh, in each issue of Good Dog. Right, right. Telling about their dog. So, uh, you know, it, you're, you're in good company with this book and, and writing about dogs. Well, you know, it's funny. I, uh... Uh, 35 years ago, uh, thereabouts, I'm probably getting the timing wrong, but uh, there was a, a book critic who, who uh, and I discovered long, long, long ago that if you want to keep from going crazy, don't ever read a review of your own books. You just don't do it. And uh, uh, But there was a critic uh, when I was still a young man who who uh, had read, uh, you know, the book about my mom. Uh, and we lucked onto the bestseller list with that. And then, then he read the book about my grandpa where we had lucked onto the list with it. And I'm not trying to be facetious. I mean, just, you know, you write about poor people in the deep South. It is surprising sometimes to see them do well. And, uh, and, but he had a line in his review that said, well, he's written about his mama and he's written about his daddy. Excuse me. And he's written about his grandpa. I guess next we'll have to read about his old dog, Blue. And I determined right then, 35 years ago, that I was going to write a damn dog book at some point, just so I can say, see, uh, uh, you were right. But uh, I did this book intending to do a different book. And Curtis, I don't know if this has ever happened to you or not, but I, I started it with great intentions of, a, of an easy book. You know, I was going to do an easy book. COVID had locked everything down and, you know, uh, I thought this would be a, a good book about a bad dog. And that's all I intended it to be. 
Willie Morris's, you know, as you know, uh, my dog Skip was uh, was an inspiration, but 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 I went into it knowing full well I couldn't do that. This would not be the thing. It was kind of precious about Skip was uh, it was all about a boy and his dog, and it was the writing that made that that made that slim volume so special and but it was about a boy and his dog and there's a line in my book where I say every dog needs a boy you know every dog needs somebody to bang through the screen door and run through the mud puddles and and just create havoc and seek out these great adventures well this didn't happen you know that me and Speck kind of found each other in more tragic times for both of us. But I wanted it to have some of the spirit of, or some of the sweetness of Willie's story. But at the same time, I envisioned it as kind of a poor white trash version of Call of the Wild. Because, you know, like Buck, in Call of the Wild, and that's one of my favorite books. But like Buck, uh, Speck is fearless, utterly fearless. You know, he he'll hit stray dogs or even coyotes five to one. He don't care. You know, he just doesn't care. He's been tore up more times than I can count, and um, um, he's just fearless and. And I envisioned that being the book that, that, you know, somewhere between those two books, but real life took over and we began to lose people. And as I said before, my brother Sam got sick and I, I kind of did too. And, and it became a, a, a deeper, I hope, book but it didn't come that way naturally. And if you read the thing, I didn't go back and redo it when all this started to happen. The beginning of the book has a completely different feel is the end. And uh, I just kind of did the book where life kind of took us. And and I wasn't going to do a dead dog book. I wasn't going to write a philosophically about my dog leaving this world I uh, I stopped the book before I had to write of my brother Sam's passing and I decided that I could not bear to write about the the loss of the dog and I guarantee to you that 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 dog right now is laying up under my pickup waiting for me to come outside and uh so he can, you know, get scratched and rubbed a little bit. Or he might be in there on the couch. He and mom sit down there and watch the Virginian. He is a, he likes the Virginian because the, uh, the, uh, he has determined that the gunfire on the Virginian is fake and he knows it can't hurt him. And, um, so yeah, he's, it just didn't, you know, Curtis, it just didn't become what I thought it was going to be. Um, well, it came out all right. I can assure you. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. Know, you. There, there's a, another writer. I'm pretty sure it was the late Jim Harrison, who certainly passed through square books more than once. Yeah. yeah. In his lifetime. Um, and one of his books, he had a character that kept, growing uh, bits of food to his dog and uh, all the time. And somebody finally said, you know, why do you keep uh, uh, doing that? And he said, well, it's a birthday treat for my dog. He says, you know, dogs don't have very many birthdays. So he needs all the treats he can get. Man. And I, I just, as a dog lover myself, that, that line, really stayed with me it was touching and you know we think about it if we're lucky we've got a dog no more than a dozen or 15 years yeah yeah 
and and often with us, Curtis, you know, we, uh, my brother's hunting dogs, he had a hunting dog live, uh, I think it was 16, 17 years. Uh, but, you know, usually we kind of rescue a stray and often strays, you know, are kind of ticking time bombs. And uh, Speck has got a collapsed trachea. He's been hit by at least one car. He's been, like I said, he's been tore up pretty bad more than once. And and uh, just recently, I, uh, he somehow managed to almost tear his left rear leg off. He we had to rebuild his ACL, which I found out that rebuilding an animal's ACL is just about the same amount of money as rebuilding a human one. And, uh, but he's worth every nickel and he's worth every treat and he's worth every biscuit. If I go to town in the morning and, and maybe this is part of my problem, but if I go to town in the morning and I get a, uh, a sausage biscuit, then he gets a bacon, egg, and cheese one. I'm smart enough to buy my dog a healthier biscuit than I buy for me. Uh, so he, uh, there ain't enough treats in the world for a, for a good, bad dog, I don't think. You, you're being very eloquent here talking about your dog. There's another passage I want to read from your yeah. book talking about Speck. He's not even a good bad dog. Bad dogs in literature were lovable roles, not recidivists like mine. Um, and say, uh, I know I couldn't get someone to steal him if I stuck a thousand dollar bills on him with hairpins yet I would not sell him at any price. You can't dog, can't buy a dog like this. No, you gotta go, you gotta go find him. You know, I think there's, uh, I think if you want a dog like this, you gotta go find one. You gotta go get one, I think I wrote. You gotta go get one out of the trash. And um, we had seen Speck. Uh, uh, always running, you know, running them ditches. And, you know, three, four dogs around him, sometimes five or six, you know, uh, turning over garbage cans and, and people shoot them. A lot of these farmers around here, they're not going to tolerate, uh, they're not going to tolerate a bunch of strays uh, worrying their livestock or they just won't tolerate it. I dug a little piece of lead shot out of spec uh, that it ain't no telling how long that had been in there on him. I don't know if it was a BB or a piece of bird shot. It's hard to tell, but he, uh, you know, it, it, I never could get close enough to him to, to, to rescue him until he almost starved to death. And, uh, you know, I, I, I wake up every day sometimes and think, you know, man, I should have tried harder. You know, I should have tried, you know, just a little bit harder and maybe I could have got him before he had had so much damage to him. But, you know, the best you can do, I think with a dog like that is you give them a, you take care of them when they're sick and you feed them too much and you give them a porch or even a couch to lay on. He will go down and get on the foot of my bed. And I realize that that's an abomination in the eyes of many people, but he'll get on the foot of the bed and, and he will snooze sometimes for three hours straight, gathering his strength to go out and destroy something. But, uh, he can pretty much do right now pretty much anything he wants. Um, we've forgiven him every transgression and, um, you know, 
my brother Sam uh, said, you know, I could forgive that dog anything except the grave robbing. You know, I could forgive him anything. And I, that made me, in my mind, I started thinking, well, what if we live close to a human cemetery? You know, what if we woke up one morning and looked out in the yard and there went my dog tugging by the dress hem, somebody's recently departed, ain't Lurleen. So I guess we should consider ourselves fortunate that it's just a deer or a possum. He'll play with the dead possum for, you know, two, three days until I get it and, you know, put it in a sack and take it away. And then he's mad at me for two days. So, he, you know, he's. Well, Rick, uh, I've known you to write about all sorts of rascals like Jerry Lee Lewis, your biography of him. And uh, when you were working for a newspaper, you wrote about you know, all sorts of loathsome characters, you know, racist and car thieves and thugs and whatever. I never thought you'd write a love story, but <laughs> this is a love story. I hope so. I mean, I, I hope so. I mean, he's, yeah, I discovered something, Curtis, about dogs. You know, dogs don't give very good quotes. And, uh, you know, you have to read the world into them. You know, you got to, you got to read the whole world into them. Uh, and uh, because of that, you I wonder if you really ever write a dog book or if you write about the way that your own life and your own fears and your own disappointments and, and hopes and everything kind of stick to that dog you know like cockleburs you know like uh do you remember a a a, a, a seed called uh, uh we called it booger lice and i think other people called it beggar lice it was it was really a seed pod and if uh, if they'd run through the pasture it would man it would stick to them like cockleburs and i think that's that that a dog book or at least maybe a dog like this, it kind of is like that. It just kind of, everything that you think or, or feel can stick to them and, 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 and they just carry it around with them. I call him, I think once in this book, I call him a sin eater, you know, cause he, uh, man, he can soak up a lot of meanness and misery and, uh, I think I said one awful sin eater of a dog. And uh, yeah, I mean, he, he, uh, he don't do well on screen. The last time I tried to get him on, uh, last time I tried to get him on the screen, he, uh, he tore up half the room. Uh, but he, uh, people ask me, say, are you ever going to take him on book tour? And I said, hell no. Could you imagine what that, and plus it would scare him. Yeah. And yeah, I wouldn't scare him for nothing in the world. He, he ain't scared of creatures in the night, but he would be scared of a crowd yeah. of people. Uh, Rick, I'm getting prompted to uh, turn this over to questions from uh, the audience out, uh, out in wherever they are, cyberspace, whatever. So uh, Caitlin, uh, you're going to pass on the, the questions to Rick. Right. Yes. Um, I'm sorry. Like, I just got like, kind of emotional listening to you all talk about all these good, bad dogs. Um, yeah, so we do have some questions. Um, and those of you who maybe haven't submitted one, uh, now's the time. So let's see. Um, all righty. Well, actually, I kind of want to start with something that's just um, very kind. Um, Bill writes, in my 70s, I understand that there is no better example of love, loyalty, and forgiveness than a good dog. There ought to be a law that every clergy has to own a dog so they know what they're talking about. Um, and, and there's lots of, of sweet comments like that who are, you know, people sharing um, just their, their thanks and gratitude for this beautiful book you've written and um, for all of your work. But let's get into the questions. I'm just um, rambling. 
Okay. Oh, this is a good one that I would love to hear the answer um, from both of y'all, if that's okay. Uh, this attendee says, Rick is one of my favorite authors. Who are some of your favorite authors and um, who should we be adding to our reading list? Well, Curtis, you want me to go first? And sure. It's your show, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I was just, I've, I've been thinking a lot lately since his death about McMurtry. Larry McMurtry. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about uh, Last Picture Show and thinking about a character called Sam the Lion who, um, you know, offers his wisdom. Uh, he doesn't throw it around like Nichols. You know, he, he has real wisdom and and there's a scene where the, the boys are, one of the boys is talking about making a fool over, a fool of himself over a beautiful young woman. And, and uh, Sam the lion, who is an old cowboy, says, um, ain't no bad time to make a fool over a woman like that. And, uh, and it just kind of gives you permission somehow to, to, to act a fool about things that are maybe worth something, if only for a few blinks in time. Uh, so McMurtry uh, taught me an awful lot about, taught me an awful lot about writing. Uh, you know, I, you know, I read a James Lee Burke line about a jute joint in, uh, in Louisiana that, uh, I think it was in a book called Jolie Blonde's Bounce. And, uh, and it was about how in, at night that, uh, jute joint just pulses with, with, uh, you know, neon and electric guitars and broken bottles and uh, men howling with rage and, you know, women screaming. And, and then in the daylight, it just disappears. You know, it's just gray, clapboard, nothing. So I, I don't know. I tend to like those writers that are... Uh, um, you know, Hemingway's short stories, if you read Hemingway's short stories and you don't see some genius in there, then I think maybe it'd be a good time to take up carpentry. Uh, I'd take up carpentry right now if I could hammer a straight nail. But uh, so I think you just, you know, it's just, and, it, and if you ask me this question, Curtis, I don't know if you're like this, but if you ask me this question, Tomorrow, I'd have five different answers, you know, for you. Yeah. No, there, uh, there are a lot of writers that I like. I, I particularly admire uh, our friend Richard Ford. You know, oh, Richard. sure, sure. Yeah. And I think his uh, his books uh, on Frank Bascom, beginning with the sports writer and going through, really captured uh about a quarter of a century in, of America. Yeah. With all the, you know, the Reagan era, you know, uh, what what can we get next? You know, uh, you know, what can we do for ourselves? And, right. uh, and you know, the guys that is a real estate salesman. And uh, I just think it, it, he does a great job with that. I, I also like very much uh, a writer that, uh, it died a couple of years ago, Robert Stone. Mm -hmm. uh, not everybody was familiar with him, but uh, he was one hell of a writer. And I think uh, one of his early books called Dog Soldiers is uh, right up there with uh, the best novel I ever read. Sometimes you see a line, you know, a line, and you, you forgive that writer every other 
thing that they ever did. Uh, you know, uh, Willie was like that. Uh, Willie had a, a passage from, um, from um, My Dog Skip where he just writes about he and his daddy uh, catching fish until a thunderstorm settles in and they flee to the bank and hide in an old cabin or shed. And when it's over with, his daddy decides that they've caught enough fish and, quote, I guess we'll just leave them others to get grown. Uh, and that is exactly dead on perfect for the way that uh, the old man talked to me, you know, when I was a kid. And they talked in poetry. Um, uh, and Pat Conroy. You know, you could forgive Pat anything, you know, uh, uh, because of, a, you know, one uh, perfect, you know, one perfect line. So sometimes I wonder if I, if I really am in love with the story or as Willie said one time to me, Sonny boy, you say it's the you say it's the story that people love and I say it's the language and I never did forget that. Oh, thank you both. Um, and I, you're right, it is a hard question to answer. It's an impossible question to answer in a lot of ways, but I think you both did it um, beautifully. Um, I know we have a lot of questions and we won't be able to get to them all, but um, I can't resist this one. Um, Brenda asks, Rick, did Jerry Lee have a bad dog? <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Lee had a, uh, had a uh, chihuahua. I'm not making this up. Had a chihuahua named Topaz Jr. Cause apparently Topaz had, you know, had perished. So it was Topaz Jr. And, and, you know, he, Topaz Jr. bit everybody. I mean, he, you know, he bit everybody. And he would jump up in Jerry Lee's lap. And that pleased Jerry Lee that the Chihuahua, he had like a killer Chihuahua. And Jerry Lee would, would, would you know, the dog would kind of hop up and Jerry Lee would say, you bite everybody but daddy, don't you, baby? <laughs> and, that, uh, yeah, Jerry Lee had a... When I pulled up in the driveway, uh, I was greeted by a pack of, of dogs. Uh, none of them like expensive dogs, just dogs. And that told me right then that no matter what anybody else might say about Jerry Lee, that anybody that would feed that many Stray dogs uh, couldn't be all bad. It's true. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's so funny about that. But it was a little chihuahua. Uh, okay, let's yeah, see. Maybe Topaz we'll see. Jr. Topaz Jr. Um, okay, so again, this is one that I'd love to hear the answer from both of y'all if you uh, are are willing. Um, and perhaps I don't think I know Tammy didn't mean mean it this way, but sometimes a, a tough question to answer when you just had a book come out. Um, although first she says, just finished the book today and loved it, of course. Um, are you working on another project yet? And if so, would you care to tell us a little bit about it, both of you? Curtis, you wanna? Oh, I, I, that's an easy one. I have no plans uh, cooking <laughs> at this point. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, I didn't intend to write uh, uh, the new one. It just kind of, the, the story kind of fell in my lap three years ago. So uh, no, I, 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 I have, have nothing. I've retired from uh, Globe more than 20 years ago and just retired after damn near 20 years of teaching at Ole Miss. So I guess I've kind of retired from writing books too, but, 
but I, you know, to use the cliche, I never say never. Yeah, I, I would be, I would be greatly surprised if you and disappointed, not trying to kiss up to you, but um, uh, I, uh, I have had a like Curtis. I, I never could often see the point in a novel when there were so many real stories that I wanted to save, you know. Uh, <clears throat> novels always seem to me like a thing that would always be there, you know like it, the thing that would always be there, like the pine trees would always be there. Um, and that there were things and people that I wanted and needed to, to keep telling about. I part really was cause that torch I carry for, you know, for, you know, working people in the deep South. I, um, I, I realize their warts, and I have certainly written about their warts, mostly in journalism. But I, I always thought, you know, there was always seemed like there was another story that kind of smacked you in the teeth, you know, and you needed to do it. But I think I, I, I can't write about family anymore, because to be not trying to be melodramatic or gothic, but my heart's broke. And uh, I, 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 I just don't think I can. Uh, I had come to, to write about death and journalism as, um, as some great adventure. You know, it, it didn't matter if you were writing about, you know, hundreds of people killed in one night. You know, is that you know, as democracy tries to break out on some godforsaken place in the Caribbean, or if you're writing about, um, you know, little boys in Pakistan flying model airplanes into model versions of the Twin Towers, you know, it, 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 the. I had written about death most of my life as kind of this great adventure. Well, you know, there ain't, you know, it, but when it hits you right in, in your mouth, there's nothing adventurous at all about it. And, and I have no interest in right now. I, I, I wondered how I would ever write a book to honor my brother, Sam. I mean, he's the last real Southern man in a world of khaki pant wearing uh, you know, Southern man who can't change a tire. You know, he was the real thing. And, but I can't, you know, I just don't have the guts to, to write about it now. So what do you write about? Uh, well, I, like Curtis right now, nothing for about, uh, a month or two, I'm not going to do a damn thing. Um, but there's always been, you know, that that made up story out there. And I suspect I'll. I'll I wrote a, a proposal once many, many years ago, and and believe it or not, it's in a file somewhere, uh, I think, in, in New York at the publishing house. And it was the first line to a novel. And I wasn't sure what the novel was going to be about, but it will begin with this line. The carnival owner never really liked midgets, comma, because they were always getting drunk on a thimble full of bootleg whiskey, comma, and falling off their Shetland ponies, period. I don't know what I'm going to write, but somehow it's going to start with that line. You've heard it here first. Um, so I know that there, there are a lot more questions and, um, and I am so sorry that we, we could not get to them all. Um, but I wanna thank you both for just um, a really wonderful 
evening uh, kind of meditation on, on puppy dogs. And, and you've both spoken so eloquently on um, all the kind of uh, big feelings that those uh, sweet dogs can elicit. And, um, and I also wanna thank our, our audience. Um, a lot of y'all shared some really sweet anecdotes. And if we had more time, we, we'd stay here all night and just talk about our, our favorite dogs and our best times with them. But um, I do want to remind folks, I've dropped it in the chat maybe too many times. It's never too many times to sell a good book though. Um, we do have signed first editions. Let's see, there we go, of, uh, of Rick's latest book. Uh, and this is like actually signed. It's got Providence, he came in Oxford, to Oxford to sign it, which is um, a rarity in these long, strange times. And we're so grateful, Rick, that you could take the time to do that. Um, we've also got signed first editions of Curtis Wilkie's very wonderful uh, When Evil Lived in Laurel, a uh, very different book, <laughs> but, um, but a very good book in its own right. Um, but, and I'd also like to remind folks that we can't do these events, virtual, hybrid, in-person, drive-by, whatever, whatever we think of next, um, without your support. So um, if you haven't picked up the book yet, um, please do uh, from Square Books. We would love to put it in your hands. Um, but yeah, um, thank you both for, for sharing your evening with us. And um, I guess we'll just wrap it up now unless you'd like to say anything else, no pressure. <laughs> thank you. And, and, and Curtis, I'm, as always, you know, I'm honored to, I'm honored to, to even pretend to, to share some of my ignorance. I appreciate it and appreciate everything you do. Rick, it's real good seeing you again. I hope I see you in the flesh before long. So you take care. Yeah. Yes. You too. All right. Well, thank y'all. Yeah. All right, gang. Good night. Thank you so much. Thanks, Everybody thanks. take care. All right. Bye. Good night.